Welcome everyone and welcome um, to the panel talk hosted by the Digital Stationery Consortium. Today we have six leaders of um, industry, um, really thought leaders in their domain. And today we're going to talk about um, new work and the future of digital education. So it will be a panel talk talking really about how um, COVID really overnight changed our society, changed the way we work, changed really dramatically the way uh, kids and students are learning, changed the way teacher um, engage with their students. So today um, uh, we have invited um, the thought leaders to really share from their perspective um, about the impacts from COVID on new work, on new way of education, and also what's um, your vision and also um, perspective in the future. Before we get started, let me start to introduce um, um, Digital Stationery Consortium. So this panel, this group is just part of the Digital Stationery Consortium. We are a group of uh, many industry partners from software, hardware, technology, branded products. We have also stationery um, partners from the analog world really also starting to engage with us on digital stationaries. So um, it all started with technology and product partnership. Over the time, we realized really the needs to, to engage with the society, to engage with different um, user groups and industry um, partners um, to talk about the use case of digital pen, ink and paper. This is what we call digital stationery and really to also promote the value of um, encouraging people using um, digital stationaries. So let me start uh, with a short introduction of the um, panelists here. Um, I would like to start with um, Ms. Katarina Cho. So Katarina, hi. So hi. Katarina is responsible for um, technology partnerships at Samsung Electronics. And you are dialing in from Korea, right? From South Korea. Yes, I am. South Korea, Seoul. Second person I would like to introduce is Ms. Um, Erna Müller. Hello. Thank you for joining this. Um, Erna, she is the educational advisor at Städtler. Um, she's dialing in from Germany. So thank you for participating in this panel talk. Uh, next one I would like to introduce is Felix. So Dr. Felix Opschonka. Um, Felix is um, director of new technologies at Mont Blanc, dialing in also from Germany. And next one is Johnson. So Johnson Lee. Johnson Lee is um, CEO of E-Ink Holdings and you're dialing in from Taiwan, correct? Yes, yes. Next one will be Peter, Peter Jackson. Thank you for joining. It's very early morning at your side. I can see that. So dialing in from- um, or, or late night. <laughs> late night. <laughs> so Peter is the CEO of Bluescape um, based in San Francisco, US. And Nobu, next one is Nobu. Nobu Edith. Hello. Hello, Hello Nobu. So Nobu is uh, CEO of Wacom and also the chairman of the Digital Stationery Consortium DSC. And dialing in from Tokyo. So you're in our office, I can see. Empty, empty office. <laughs> <laughs> right, and myself, I'm Heidi Wang. So um, I'm dialing in from Switzerland and I am in charge of Wacom um, Inc. division. At the same time, also responsible for the daily operations of the Digital Stationery Consortium. And today I'm going to host this panel talk. So, so thank you um, all for joining and also um, listening. So COVID-19 um, really changed all our life upside down, I think, um, um, overnight. And um, I would like to, to kick off really the discussion, really ask you to share how did you perceive this? So it changed the way people work. It changed, of course, how you work in your companies, how you deal with customers. So do you mind to share um, how you perceive this challenging phase? The COVID-19 came very unexpected. Um, initially for us, the first thing that affected us was the whole supply chain. Um, I'm sure that's true with everybody that's in the electronic business. So the whole supply chain was really disrupted. And whoever can really get the supply chain to start working again can really start shipping products. So that was the first thing. I think the second thing that people were worried about is the safety of um, people working at, within the organization, which is the same at EINC. So we have locations in US, in Tokyo, in, in Seoul, in, in Taiwan, in China, and every, every place where we had operations at, um, we're really affected by the COVID. And we really have to use the global supply chain just to even ship um, 
mask around for, for our people. So there was a shortage in, in China. So we had to shift from either Japan or, or Korea or Taiwan. Or when there is a sh shortage in US, we have to ship it from everywhere around the world. Um, I think very luckily because we're all part of this digital transformation. You know, everybody knows that this trend is coming because of COVID. I think it really triggers um, the adoption rate of this digital transformation. I can either from the electronic side, the software side, or even the software we're using like Zoom, it really took off. Johnson, I. I really agree with you, you know, actually it happened all of a sudden and the whole supply chain crashed and uh, we have to care about our safety of team members and all family shut down the office, everything happened in one night. But uh, it's also true, uh, we have been preparing, I mean, not, not just Wacom, but uh, you know, whole society or communities or industries, somehow we are tr uh, we were trying to prepare. So, you know, it's, it's not just starting from zero. Very, very quickly, uh, we're catching up, like our Zoom teams and their remote work. And we try to continue the business uh, at the same time of securing their uh, team members of uh, safety and health. So I, I, I'm feeling like it's happened, yes, in one night. But we really quickly, you know, reacting and trying to recover that, or oh, thanks to their, you know, previous preparations or, in, uh, you know, in the middle of digital transformation. So th that's, you know, very first impression I got. I would echo the the sort of same challenges about, you know, your 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 employees or your family, and you quickly get uh, worried about how this is going to, you know, change them. This was obviously you know, right around that first week of March when we were all considering shutdown. I didn't debate it. Um, I had come out of UCSF and been with the CDC and saw what was going on in China. And so I just, we were, we we're a lot of the Silicon Valley people were involved in that. We shut down very quickly. The, the thing that happened next was we already knew that 24, 25% of the workforce in the United States was working remotely already. And we were preparing uh, over the last three years to build a platform for remote work. We were about 80% of the way through that and had a lot of customers that were sort of living with the, the missing elements of our product. Um, within uh, 30 days, um, our company essentially tripled in revenue and demand. Um, and then not being able to hire and uh, people seeing them face to face was certainly a new challenge, uh, virtual hiring. Um, and then also meeting the needs and the demands of these, uh, these new customers and that's been ongoing. So in a sense, I guess to, to finish it, you know, we had to practice what we preach. Um, we don't have anybody going into offices. We have roughly, you know, 250 employees that are working remotely. Uh, the challenge of that I'll finish with is that, you know, while some people may be in large square footage areas, um, or there are many people that could be like uh, in Japan or New York where there's small square footage and they've got two dogs, a baby, um, yeah. And they're sharing an environment that is that is not healthy. So I think there's been, you know, it was kind of cute the first uh, maybe 60 days. We were all texting our old friends and having Zoom calls with old college friends and whatnot. And then quickly, I think those have kind of dissolved a bit. And I think that we're dealing now with, you know, what's the new, when's the pendulum come back and at what rate and, and where? From a business perspective, it was really interesting because we are, a company which is producing mainly analog products and our um, colleagues um, had a lot of discussions with us before the lockdown came, what is not possible in digital work and why it is not possible. And suddenly overnight, it was the new reality and we all had to deal with it and we all had to find our, our, our solutions for it. And we learned by doing, and it was really nice to see that it is possible. And um, on the other side, it was quite interesting to see um, one side, the opportunities digital work gives us, but on the other side, also the limits. Because before the lockdown came, as Peter also said, it was a lot of discussions about, I want to make home office because I want to have a better work-life balance. And then the lockdown came, <laughs> the people asked us, can we please return to the office? Because uh, we have to separate our private life from the business life. So also here we see a very good balance between these two worlds. And I think what um, 
COVID-19 will educate us is that there is no either nor digital or analog use. There is a balance between both and the usage has its unique values and they can perfectly go hand in hand with each other. What before the lockdown came was a huge question and a lot of fear was, uh, was, was there with, uh, with the COVID. Mm -hmm. If in particular, we also have a production team here. So also we had to stop production. Uh, we had to make sure that everyone is safe in the environment people are working in. And I think for office workers, it's, it's always a bit more easier because basically you have your laptop, you can take it at home and work from home, but also to make sure that your workers at the production line, these guys that are responsible of making this beautiful craft process, that they, they are safe, that they are uh, safe. It, it was super important for us and it was some challenging time because usually you build a production different than you would build a table at the office. So. Um, these uh, prove to be some challenges, as well as if you look more on the customer end of side, we are a company who are a lot relying on a face-to-face -face contact to our customers, meaning that they come to our physical retail stores and they are being treated very well there and get, uh, get, uh, get nice information from our sales staff and so on. All of this, we, we had to close basically and um, all the stores being shut down and um, people that actually wanted to buy our products and wanted to get kind of like the information and, and all this, they suddenly were like, okay, what do we do now? And here, I think where we showed a great agility in our business was kind of like switching also from uh, getting this person treatment via tools like Zoom or other digital video conferencing systems to make sure that we get this closeness to the customer, even this tough time still alive. And I think that was was for us uh, a big uh, a big part. In particular, if you think about our consumer, it's the it's a traveler. So the first thing which was shut down was traveling. So basically, to reach now to this new clientele is is very uh, it was was very new to us, and we had to treat it very very differently to what we usually do in our business. Mm -hmm. Do you expect this will stay? And maybe I just make it, I know a lot of you guys as well uh, and, and personally also travel a lot. And if you just think about yourself and how you did actually travel before the pandemic, um, if I just think about myself, it was crazy. I was traveling like every week. I was going around the globe. I was uh, having continuously jet lag, sleeping every night in a different hotel and so on. It was just like a craziness and travel that we all had that we never actually actually reflected on. It was just such a given in our business that we do that. And I think what will change is that people are becoming more aware of, of, of this and are becoming more aware of their traveling style and are more conscious about this. So I definitely think there will be uh, a, a new normal out there that will change from the prior status to new status quo. Yeah? Also when it comes to sustainability and so on and the effects that we see throughout that time. So I think really that here there was a, a paradigm shift from this global traveling uh, towards being more local and getting more things done also via video conferencing. Well, as a manufacturer for mobile products, the COVID-19 situation helped us witness what, um, well, for Korea, what great IT infrastructure we had. And because like the Korea Disease Control um, and Prevention Agency, like it's a government organization, they inform citizens with um, the information of COVID-19 so that you could be ensured to be safe where you are by sending messages on your smartphone, cell phones of the latest confirmed cases and where these anonymous positive patients are have been found so that you could be aware of it. And um, just the fact that our products helped um, citizens be, be more aware of the situation and become safe, be more safe in their homes um, was fascinating to see. Um, and I was amazed at how fast everyone just adapted to taking the offline operations to online effectively using our products. Did you discover, I think it's a question to all of you, uh, in, in, in your product portfolio or in the value proposition that you deliver to your customers, any changes, new requirements, new inspirations for new type of products? Did you discover this? You know, you want to put these tools 
um, in front of people, whether it's students or you're working from home and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the thing that gets lost more than anything else is, and I want to yell right brain. Um, and there weren't more things we did with our technology than that a lot of people in this group did. I mean, the, the fact that we have, pen, we're talking about pen computing and, and, the, and the ability to, to use your brain and to draw, like I wrote better when I was 22 than I was 32. And now it's, it's abysmal, my handwriting. And, and I recognize that now I'm trying to write more um, and use that because I think it, it, it ex makes me express more. And so I don't think getting digital transformation means we all put on VR and sit in a living room with our families with glasses on and end up in strange places of the world or universe. <laughs> um, and I don't think that that's a benefit to who we are as human beings. You know, digital transformation sounds really great. Um, I still think we have to have, be humans. And I think combining this idea that we're using uh, things like this to express ourselves is probably going to be a better thing moving forward than if all our kids don't know how to write. Oh, and we're coming from, from a history of the art of writing. So basically combining what Nobu said with art and what Peter said with analog exactly. writing. And um, what, what we basically did is that there's a lot of uh, artists out there who are using uh, pens for artistic writing, calligraphy. And we actually invited them as a platform to engage with our customers. So basically we have all the Zoom calligraphy classes. And it was not meant from us as being kind of like a sales tool or something. It was really, uh, if you own a Mont Blanc or any other writing instrument, we didn't care. Uh, but um, in, in the end, what we've seen is that, uh, first we gave a platform to these artists. Second, what we've seen is that a lot of clients or consumers or users that actually logged into these sessions, uh, they were delighted about refocusing, learning something new, getting artistic while they're being in a lockdown. So a lot of people were actually not able to move anywhere. And for them, they actually learned a new skill. And basically, they learned writing in a different way, but it was kind of like repurposing. And that's, that's something we, I'm not sure how many classes we did, but we did uh, dozens of classes in different regions and so on. And we've seen also that a lot of people were really thankful about getting them, uh, let's call it distraction, or getting them something kind of like to tear away their brain or their mind from this really difficult situation for some of them and bring them some beauty. And I think that exactly what you said, Nobu, I think that thinking about what platforms we can deliver to artists, what platforms we can deliver also to analog way in a digital way, it can be very valuable. Uh, also on a personal level, very valuable. Internally, these days, we think a lot about how uh, we can elevate connectivity with not only between our devices, but also um, ways that can alleviate the stress for people to work at home um, and in new environments, such as, let's say you are writing um, on your tablet, but you need to this, you need to like convert this straight away into a new document form that you could share with your colleagues um, halfway across the world. Um, we try to focus on how we can help you do that by allowing um, easier access on your Samsung Notes applications to your maybe Microsoft um, applications. Um, these kind of ideas, uh, we try to build more internally and we try to think how we can make it to viable products on our next generation devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really remarkable to experience also how you think about, okay, how we can deliver like more value, simplicity, uh -huh. um, but also um, the creative side there really is mm -hmm. the, people being struggling in this situation. And as, Pete, as, as Felix you said, right, people start to think about, okay, um, about themselves, thinking, creating art, even trying to, to live more hobbies, really um, to, to be more self-centric and self-conscious. So I think creativity is something I see really as an important theme also in this challenge. At the same time, we have the challenges being disconnected physically. But at the same time, I feel people getting more creative and finding way to connect to each other. And do you see um, the paradigm of creative work? Let's talk about the team new work. I have to be always in the room with whiteboard. So 
what do you think? I think I personally think it it really helps us to to live this in a new way, in a mobile way, and I don't feel that we are really sacrificing. Actually, you know, <laughs> uh, personally, uh, like Felix mentioned, you know, uh, we stopped flying, right? <laughs> and there, uh, there, it's really uh, by by stopping a flying over and over everywhere. Uh, I, I'm feeling like I reserved some uh, kind of a very precious time, immersive time for myself. Because while you're moving around, you know, there, you're doing something. You're always connected, you know, in the, in, even in the airplane, you're connected and email, chatting, everything. So you just just keep running. But when we stop there flying, <laughs> i feeling like, oh, I guess some are very precious and important time to be immersive, <laughs> a deep thinker in their, you know, kind of a deep discussion with team member, whether it's a real talk or, you know, the uh, online talk. And uh, and to Peter's point, it's, it's amazing. I get time to <laughs> kind of a write and think and debate myself and there. Uh, yeah, I like to ask the Johnson, you know, I think we, we're working for the same solutions and they're like our ink based device. This is a very immersive device, right? It's 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 not a device right. for their uh, watching the Netflix or a uh, social right, game. Right. It's for writing and drawing, but it's it's getting very popular during this COVID-19. So people start to have some immersive timing to face with this kind of a writing drawing experience. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think because of COVID, um, people that's, I mean, or companies that's focused on digital products really have benefited from it. Or even software that's that's based out of digital products um, has really benefited from it. I, I'm very like you, Nobu, that I travel a lot um, before the COVID. I travel almost on a weekly basis, just like Felix. Um, but because because of COVID, I realize that I do actually have more time. I can't travel. And because I can't travel, I realize that I have so much time to spend. And I, at first, I didn't know what I should be spending that time on. Um, then I get to spend more time with my family. But at the same time, I get to spend more time looking internally at, at eating to see what we can improve on to make us more competitive. And I think because of COVID, because of less traveling, it actually helps me um, to spend a lot more time looking at Inc. internally and see what we can do to, to, to further on to grow. Because back then I, I usually travel because of meeting new customers or looking at you know when there's a monthly meeting, but there's no time really to, to sit down like what nobody had said. It's to immerse yourself and so, and to, I mean, to have more deeper thinking about stuff that, that you really care about. Um, and I think because of COVID, it actually gave me a lot of time to, to focus on what, what we need to improve on. So, yeah, I mean, there's always the good and bad. Um, and that's something that's more positive side that's coming out of COVID. But at the same time, I do miss the traveling. I do miss meeting with with customers meeting with suppliers or meeting with um, different people within the organization that's across the globe. Um, it will bring in new perspective, new ideas. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's good and bad in both. What do you think we, because we are all producing or um, delivering technologies, products um, to the users. So what do you think we can do as ingredients to keep, to preserve this good thing, the, the me time, the encouragement to, to think, do more thinking, to create new ideas. At the same time, um, of course, encouraging more the mobility work. So, so what do you think we as industry partners can deliver? Well, I think first of all, we benefit a lot from the COVID because um, people are, are getting used. I mean, just look at Amazon, it has the best, Best year so far because of COVID. I mean, people are shopping online. Um, people are buying more computers. They're buying more tablets. 
they're also buying more uh, for us, more more e-readers, more more no e to e no products for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really gives. I mean, we're, we're very lucky. I mean, on that perspective, that users are more willing to try out digital products and and really get a chance to really because maybe because they have more time. And I think we should really capture that opportunity and really try to make our products better. Mm -hmm. And because now people are willing to try out more digital products and I think we're all benefit from it. So it's, it's up to us to make it, make better products so that it'll engage with customer more and create a better user experience. So I think we're, we're all very lucky because of that. Yeah, I can feel this positive commitment really. I think Wacom side, I speak now is Wacom. I think what I experienced myself is over the time, really, we changed to more customer value driven. So how we can also be more into to the customer and deliver this value, also assuming the changed um, lifestyle. We are living in the market. So we have to still keep competing with, you know, other guys and we have to deliver better. These COVID things really makes us think more directly how our solution, how our technology can support, sustain their people's life, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, actually in the marketing terms, uh, we are saying, we have been saying this, but uh, mm -hmm. this COVID-19 season seriously put us to their, you know, uh, situations. We really have to think about that, you know. It's not just our, to, to win the, uh, you know, competition game, but uh, how we can support, how we can jointly run, how we can be meaningful instrument for their, you know, people's human beings. So that kind of things, I think we started to face seriously, not mm -hmm. just from marketing, you know, buzzword. So mm -hmm. th th that's what I'm feeling. All these members are somehow instrument providers, right? For the human right. being. So whether it's a hardware or software. So I think we, I think we are owing our same missions, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, actually, I agree very much with what Peter and Nobu just said, that if we're thinking about new products. We shouldn't just think about analog to digital just because we want to be modern and to participate in this digital world. We really have to ask ourselves what is uh, contributing, what gives a real value to the consumers. And this is always the question what we have to ask ourselves. And also what we are doing with the nor is digital together. This is the most natural way of human beings to express themselves, to do it by hand, to do sketches, to do little notes. This is the right way and the right direction we have to think about to transport analog to digital, but not to replace it and to see the beauty and the values of both worlds. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, the thing that I've tried to focus on in the company is a lot of non work related discussions and engagements. Um, we hired a really neat uh, technology company in the Bay Area that creates like a game show environment and then divides up all the people. Um, and so, and there was a, a variety of these different types of programs where we're engaging on a non work basis um, to, to sort of fill in that gap that we're also used to traveling around, having dinners. You know, I used to be like everybody else in this call, you know, I'd fly across the country for a cup of coffee because I felt like personal engagement was really important. And so trying to substitute that without a digital relationship, but more around learning about people or starting every call with everybody catching up on how they're doing. I also don't think of remote um, COVID as being, uh, you know, sequestered in the same place. I think that this this idea of a remote can be on a beach. Um, I, I, I found that if I get up and take my phone and go like on a five mile hike, I'm still working on my phone the whole time. So I think trying to engage people to, to, to be healthy, to, to do things outside of the digital thing um, is something that we need to focus on. The tools are great. They're gonna get a lot better. The pendulum's not going back. The offices are not gonna fill all the way back up again. I think we're gonna go we were way too far this way, but I, don't, I think we come back maybe 20, 35%. Mm -hmm. So really, um, yes, promoting digital, but also really connecting people to also more the real life. I think is also something we have to deliver also as um, industry and, and technology providers. Um, 
I'm actually curious because we talk a lot about the society and, and human beings and new value on the way. I think one of the making the bridge also to education, because I think, and I would like to ask, we're going to kick this off with Ernest um, sharing, because I think Stedler is such a strong brand um, engaged in education market for so many, many hundreds of years, as I learned. Um, so really use from childhood to adult, to being adult. Um, so how can you share how your user community, so these kids, students, and teachers are really experiencing in education space? Um, the last couple of months of this special 2020. Also here it is quite similar what we have just heard about the business environment. Also it was expected from teachers, from pupils, from parents to switch from classroom teaching to remote teaching just overnight. And there were a few uh, schools who managed this really well and who closed the classroom door on Friday and opened up the homeschooling environment on Monday. It worked smoothly and properly because they were well prepared, they were experienced, they have set up the right equipment in advance, so it didn't really make a big difference, but the most schools really had to struggle, and this is no surprise because it was expected from them to catch up with what they have missed the last two to three years in digital education, and um, the good thing about it is that they actively deal with it, and they had to do it, so they are still in a process and they will find their solution. This is sure. And this becomes the new reality in education, at least for the next few months. And if we are listening to the European ministries of education, we hear that they are thinking about different splits. How much time will people spend in school and how much time will they spend in homeschooling? And the most likely one is that 30% of the time will be held in school, classroom teaching, and 70% will be held and at home, we are homeschooling. This is a good thing because we are learning by doing and the educators are as well. But on the other side, we also see a little step back on modern pedagogy as teachers are kind of in a survival mode. And this is also not surprising because they have never educated on using these digital tools properly. Here also, they, it was expected from them to switch off uh, on digital learning just overnight. And this is just not possible. They're also still learning, but they are moving back to traditional teaching methods, such as giving lectures instead of collaborating instead of pushing modern pedagogies such as project-based learning or maker-centered learning forward because they do not really know how to use these tools. And from our point of view, it is our responsibility as companies who are producing these products for, and tools for the educational sector to really figure out what I just mentioned before, what tools really add in value and how can we help them to continue with the modern pedagogy they have just started and transported to a virtual world. In terms of modern pedagogy, um, there's still a long way to go to um, use these digital tools for this usage. For example, a lot of schools just built up uh, maker spaces in their, in their schools to really do hands-on activities, projects together with their, with their pupils. How can they transport this very physical way of learning now to a digital world. It is just like if, uh, if a teacher is giving lecture, how an experiment has to work, it's different than if the pupils are doing the experiment themselves. But if you have 24 people sitting in a Zoom conference, <laughs> how do you think this? that they work together and they do the experiment together because it has to be analog experiment, but you have to transport it in a virtual way. So this is not very easy. And I'm sure it's good that we are actively dealing with it now and also the, the teachers and that they will find solutions for these kind of purposes, but um, there is still a little way to go. Mm -hmm. I would like to learn actually, uh, because since we are also dialing in from all over the place on the globe, so how also this new education or, or the experience into digital education um, is being um, lived in Asia countries, also in US. So maybe let me learn first from, from Asia point of view. So, so Nobu, do you mind to share a little bit how it's in Japan and maybe I would listen to, love to listen to how it's going on in Korea, Taiwan. Yeah. How do you see this transformation? We are still in the middle of this kind of a transition or 
to Irena's point, we're still in survival mode. So they're right after the COVID-19 lockdown things. So the government accelerated their, you know, the programs called GIGA, which is a digital transformation in education sectors. I personally feeling it's, it's not going to the right way because, you know, it's survival mode. Okay, let's procure their machines as soon as possible, you know, under 400 US dollars. And condition is you have to finish installing within two days and uh, you have to be connected. And all these kind of uh, super urgent and survival more procurements are going on without philosophy, without philosophy. Oh, of course, it's uh, teachers are not trained how to manage this, but beyond that, you know, how we can face with technologies for their educations, you know, uh, which part we should uh, preserve for their, you know, their interactions in real world, which part we can leverage the power of digital in educations without these kind of a clear discussion, philosophy, survival mode, washed out. Okay, let's get the uh, device, you know. I think it's okay for our business perspective, honestly speaking, <laughs> but I'm so, I'm so afraid after this, you know, how it ends up for their, you know, they're in their classrooms, you know, are, are we really implementing the right philosophy of things? <laughs> so th this is my personal feeling. So Catalina, how do you think in Korea? Uh, I definitely agree that uh, leaders of the education industry needs to really think about how digital education and analog education can coexist in the future together. With such great IT infrastructure in Korea, we were already having um, education with um, not only in schools, but also out of schools with digital devices such as tablets and phones. Um, but no one was really ready when, there, when we were all condemned to this COVID-19 situation to go fully digital all of a sudden without any, without a lot of preparation. Um, but then I believe that with the right um, direction in mind, I personally believe this will bring new possibilities to um, actually raise a lot of self-esteem for not, uh, for our students because um, there are, if you reminisce back on your school days, there were times where you were having trouble inter with interactions with the teacher, maybe with your students. Um, mm -hmm. Some students maybe were slow learners, but mm -hmm. through this digital age era and this opportunity, they'll learn through the um, new technologies that they have in hand that education um, can be not only, can be more fun and something that they can be more excited about. Um, new chances will um, show our children different ways that they can excel, not mm -hmm. only in maybe like math, physical, mm -hmm. uh, phys ed. Um, some may have been little slow learners in class. Some may have talents shining outside of school subjects like maybe um, app development or coding. Mm -hmm. And some may speak up better with on their ideas behind the screens. Um, they're a bit shy in front of a lot of students. So I believe that these digital ages are new opportunities for our children to grow in ways that we were not really um, aware of, but we as a society will all learn to be accustomed together and grow from, grow and learn from the East. Yeah. How about Taiwan, Johnson? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, in Taiwan, so we're kind of, in Taiwan, the situation's a little different because um, the impact of COVID in Taiwan is quite limited. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on this little island off next to China and, and below Japan. And and so there's no traveling and, and people are really locked down on the, on the island of Taiwan. Um, so, so I think there's only three to 400 people that's been affected by COVID. Like two people has died. So there's not a lot of cases that's happening in Taiwan. Um, mm. The educational space here remains the same. Um, mm. So uh, because the effect of COVID is quite limited in Taiwan. So, but, but because I think Taiwan, just like Japan, Korea, and China, where parents really care about education. So they do spend, 
they do spend a lot of, um, they, they sent their kids after school to cram schools. Uh, that's really happening in Taiwan, even with COVID. Um, but what we're seeing from, from the market is that these cram schools are looking into technology to help with the, with the learning. So how to do one-on-one -on -one learning, how do you adopt AI to, to improve each student um, from the cram school perspective. So that part in Taiwan is, is really taking off. And then we're also seeing the same thing in China. So I think this digital transformation and the educational space will happen. It's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. um, I think the real, the real, the, the key driver to this, is, I, I really believe maybe the AI. Um, how do you have artificial intelligence and deep learning that can, that can help each student to, to really improve on their skill sets that they're weak at? And I think with AI, I think it's going to change all of this. Mm -hmm. But I also agree with, with what everybody has said that um, human to human interaction is, is, is really important. Um, because we, we're in a society, people still need to learn how to interact with people. So I still believe that in a school environment where people have to be in classes to, uh, to meet friends or, or how to interact with teachers, um, it's still gonna be very important. But learning um, with, 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 these, um, with technology and with AI, it's going to be very different. Um, it's going to be it's going to be more of a one-to-one -one training, but I think it's going to happen from a cram school um, perspective first. Then maybe then that's going to move to the mainstream. But uh, that's that, that's my thought. Yeah, so really, um, using all the AI technology really to creating new value for the digital education side. What I hear. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think because. You know, I, I think hardware is just really the bones, right? Uh, the, the soul is really the software. And I think the AI is going to be the, the game changer for, for education. Mm -hmm. Peter, maybe I would love to listen to your view, because I think U.S. is one of the country where digital education is kind of most adopted, I think, um, leading in the whole world. Um, do you also see AI really an upcoming trend to, to bring more, more value into the digital um, education sector? I mean, I, I agree with Johnson, uh, and I thought it was very eloquent the way you put it. And I think that, uh, you know, we're scrambling. Um, and, but, you know, we, we were innovators. Um, we haven't seen a lot of change in innovation in the U.S. in 20 years the way we educate. So, you know, we're trying to wrap these tools around very quickly. Um, it's forever going to be a hybrid model. Um, mm -hmm. And like uh, Johnson said, lots of one-on-one -on -one opportunities with AI. Um, the only thing I would add, there's been a lot said here that I don't want to be redundant that we're doing in the United States that sounds like they're doing in Taiwan and in Japan and Korea, but we're changing our calendars. Um, you know, the first semester starting, you know, in, in early August and ending uh, before our holiday Thanksgiving, uh, and then there's a term off uh, and then begins again in, in February, but now they're even making a mid-year term in between there uh, for students as well. So the, the calendar, the traditional calendar has changed for us. Mm -hmm. Hybrid is here to stay, mm -hmm. um, and there are gonna be great benefits from this, um, but the, you know, we have to continue to focus on the, uh, the social interactions, the one I learned in nursery school and kindergarten and college and all that it isn't just stuffing information into my brain it's it's people reading and learning how to be polite and uh, learning how to listen um, these are all skills that are uh, are difficult when you're on a conference call because there's always one mouth and multiple ears yet the, you're only hearing the mouth one mouth i think the term digital and ai are kind of controversial in the perception also of people right or how ai uh, would this harm if we expose this to small kids? We, last time, Erna, I remember we talked about digital. People perceive digital as something not helpful for the new, younger generation. So, so how, how do you think um, we can set this in the right scene? Because I believe this is, um, um, we should change the perspective, right? From, from this paradigm of like, harming digital AI to 
creating more value for the students and kids. If we want to have or to have a successful new work and a successful new digital education, we have to start with the youngest ones and we have to set the mindset for media competences already as early as possible. And we have these kind of discussions about does digital media belong in the kindergarten or not, uh, especially in Germany. And even us as a company who are, which is producing uh, mostly analog products, we say this is not the right way to keep it away from the kids. Because how can this work that we keep the kids away from digital media until they are six and they suddenly come into a situation as we have it now with COVID-19 and it, we expect them to do homeschooling <laughs> over and they never use these kind of tools properly. So from our point of view, it is essential to set the right mindset already in early childhood. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we teaching to the kindergarten kids? Mm -hmm. Preparing them for the reality which is out there. And it is digital. Formation competence is so essential in a world where we have an information overload and we have to educate our children already in kindergarten and prepare them for making own decisions, finding out what is true, what is wrong about fake news or not. I mean, if I'm thinking about my time when I was a child, I asked my mother, she knew the truth. Today, if you were asking children, they say, ask the internet. <laughs> and not always is the right answers and you have to be able to find your right answer. And this is what can be educated already in kindergarten. There are so great concepts, pedagogical concepts, but they are in the minority. And um, our, our responsibility as human beings is to really prepare the kids and to give them a chance to grow up in this digital world in a very um, thoughtful way and to become responsible citizens. The children are born to the digital age. We can't, um, just because that we didn't have digital devices when we were young doesn't mean that because uh, we don't know, they can't know until they're six, seven, eight. Uh, we have to prepare our children in advance. Um, and we have to, as adults, also be ready to tackle and face these situations where we, with our children, learn how to be more responsible and to prepare ourselves in the digital era. I mean, like these children, when we were young, um, we used to say that this is how we make phones with our hands. And these days, because children are used to more smartphones than the landline phones that we used to have, they say th these are phones like this. <laughs> They're just born into these, into these digital age and we can't stop them. So might as well just be ready and go out there and tackle the situation with them together actively it's true so it's 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 balancing story i think you know to catalina's point and their Anna's point uh mindset um their how we are going to uh balance uh you know in education sectors all uh, the buzzword steam has been discussed a long time right science technology engineering mathematics and a a doesn't have to be art, but it, it could be there. It should be liberal arts. So balancing, you know, all the different uh, perspectives and they're uh, trying to find your own way things. So mm -hmm. their scheme, uh, how we can uh, pursue this steam balance, even in digital transform education sectors. And to Johnson's point, AI, how AI can support this STEAM balance uh, for their education sector. So I, I think that the, the balancing story would be the, another key driver. Yeah. Last 16 minutes uh, we have been discussing and the many commonality, uh, some keywords, if we pick up some are engagement, you know, societies, communities, mm -hmm. kind of our connections or uh, like our things. So I think uh, as, you know, the solution provider <laughs> sitting all these the virtual round tables, I think we have missions, you know, actually we joined this digital stationary consortium uh, with a maybe different, each different unique agenda, but uh, under this very special 
uh, period, COVID-19, I think we came to face like uh, responsibility or some uh, true mission of digital stationary consortium, you know, with this technology solution provider, how we should be responsible for this uh, transformations and support skilled human beings uh, in this society things with all our technology and solution, whether it's an analog, digital, hardware, software. So it's a meaningful to get together. You know, mm -hmm. we're small communities, but we're thinking seriously how to, you know, support human being society with mm -hmm. our, you know, our solutions. So I think it's, it's almost like our, I came to, you know, feel uh, maybe this is another <laughs> Uh, revised mission of digital stationary consortium, right. meaning, meaning, you know, the reason why we are getting together here under this, think, you know, COVID-19 situation. Yeah. So that, that I'm feeling. I think it was also from our end a uh, very vivid discussion also to get the experiences from similar industry or adjacent, adjacent uh, industry players to see what their struggles were and their challenges. I, I still share the hope that uh, this is uh, a phase in our life and that this phase will also come to an end and that we can get back a bit to a normality, although we all praise digital tools and uh, I think that uh, in particular with our loved ones uh, and, and some of our colleagues all across the globe, I also hope that we can still have a time when we see each other face to face again and uh, build and share some new memories as well. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for the good uh, moderation, uh, Heidi. Thank you. And I look forward to see you all soon in one room <laughs> to also engage with you face to face. Johnson, do you want to share some closing words for, for um, the audience yeah, also? So, yeah, so, so thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Nobu, for arranging this. Um, I think because of COVID, everybody is really busy with something else. Um, there's so many things that's happening because of COVID. Um, and I appreciate Heidi and, and Nobu for setting this online. It was great to get, get a chance to see everybody else and also to meet new friends. Can't wait to sit at the, uh, the dinner table with y'all. I, I think all the people that are, uh, that are watching this uh, are engaging in it, that um, we do all need to take the time uh, to, to have perspectives about life and digital and COVID. And these are, uh, this is a healthy group of people coming at it from all around the world and just an honor to represent it from the United States. To my colleagues over here, it was great to talk to you. Um, we haven't seen each other for over a year. And this was a great opportunity to meet and greet you online. Um, I do want to say that after this COVID-19 situation, I believe that Digital Stationary Consortium will become um, more significant in the role of what we bring to the society. I, will, I have no doubt that it will become like an edifice of our intellect. And we, as homework, I think we, as industry leaders, uh, I believe that we do have to keep in mind that there are less privileged in the society um, out on the margins who may have not access to um, digital technologies. And we have to keep thinking about ways to include these people, not only with by just giving, providing them with the technology tools, the devices, but also how we could educate them together to uh, make sure that they follow the trend and become citizens of the digital era. It was really interesting to share the experiences and to talk about all the topics which were common for you in the last months and also for us. It was an honor to be here in the panel and I'm looking forward to meeting you soon in person <laughs> someday. This is Thank you. Great. I would like to thank you all also. I feel really um, the common spirit and really the, the orientation, focus and dedication and commitment that we all share um, to, to leverage technology really to deliver more value to everyone in the world. And, and thank you for participating in this panel. And I think for both of you, it's early morning, late night. Um, I know you're all busy um, and the, um, also this challenging time. So appreciate um, your support here and also appreciate sharing your insights. 
uh, with us, but also with the audience. Thank you.